30 East Drive in Pontefract has been dubbed the most violent haunting in England. What are the secrets of this haunting story? And what are some of the experiences people have had inside the home? In today's episode, I will be presenting you the history of 30 East Drive, and then I'll tell you a few of the stories of the poltergeist phenomenon at this property. Let's get started in this week's Historical Haunts. Thirty East Drive is one of the most infamous haunted locations in the UK. It is said to be haunted by a dark, shadowy figure that has been dubbed the Black Monk. But he also goes by the name Fred, as he was named by the Pritchards, the family whose story is the catalyst for the major poltergeist activity in this home. Now, let me give you a bit of the background of this home. The History of Pontefract Pontefract is traced back to the time of the Saxons as two separate villages. In the 12th century, the two villages merged and became known as Pontefract or Pomfret. The name came from Latin pons, meaning bridge, and fractus, meaning broken. The exact location of this broken bridge is still being debated. Pontefract used to be the fourth largest town in the area that is current day Yorkshire. Pontefract's castle was one of the key aspects that made the town thrive in the classical era. The castle was the main settlement of what is now West Yorkshire. Built on the site of an early Saxon fort that sat on top of a rocky hill, it was designed in such a way to make it difficult to attack. The elevated plateau of stone protected it from assailants for its whole life. It went through two civil wars where 762 soldiers passed away on the land. Additionally, King Richard II was imprisoned in the castle and died there. Some suspect due to starvation. Pontefract certainly has a long history of events that shaped parts of England to this day. Now, 30 East Drive, people call the ghost or demonic entity there the Black Monk. Why is that? Well, one day in the 1980s, a local historian, Tom Cunniff, heard about the hauntings of 30 East Drive. He already knew about a priory of monks that existed in Pontefract, and he began to try to piece together a possible link, the Dominican Priory. The Dominican Priory, also known as the Order of Friar Preachers or the Black Friars, was established in 1223. They were dedicated to the Church, Our Lady, and St. John the Evangelist. Their main priory headquarters in London were used for important events, one such being the divorce trial between Queen Catherine of Aragon and King Henry VIII. When King Henry VIII started the Reformation from Catholicism to Protestant, he dissolved the monasteries and the priories and any remaining monks went into hiding. That is until the death of Henry VIII and his daughter, Queen Mary Tudor, ascended to the throne. Queen Mary gave the Church of St. Bartholomew the Great to the Dominicans in 1555 as a part of her attempt to restore the Catholic faith in England. But soon after, in 1559, Mary died and the Dominicans officially died with her. After her death, Queen Elizabeth took the throne and she was Protestant. And that's a very condensed story of the Dominican Priory. And that's why they call this poltergeist or demon the Black Monk. So, Let's get back to the 1980s and the historian Tom. The Black Monk of Pontefract. Tom went and spoke with the family who was still living at the house. The mother, Jean Pritchard, told Tom that there was a book in the library that told the story of a monk in the 1500s who kidnapped an adolescent girl. He apparently essayed her and then unalived her. He was captured, charged, and hung at the gallows. People also said that he was dumped into a nearby well. Now here's where I will point out that there's some glaring holes in some of the stories of 30 East Drive. This is the first one. Firstly, Tom, after some research, found that 30 East Drive was built on top of the hill that the gallows stood on. But future books written by another author who has an agenda instead say that the gallows was on a hill behind 30 East Drive. 30 East Drive was built on top of the well that the monk was thrown in. There's apparently some witness accounts that say that they found the well when they were fixing 79 Checkerfield Road, which shares a dividing wall within 30 East Drive. These are connected houses. Apparently, the eyewitness said that the well straddled the two properties underneath their floors. The story of the well showed up after the hauntings became a popular story and also an apparent account of the neighbor, May Mountain, who lived at 79 Checkerfield, May said that she saw a monk in a black 
cloak with his hood up. And when she tried to approach him, he disappeared. So suddenly, all the sightings of a black-robed man inside the house made sense. And thus, they created the nickname, the Black Monk of Pontefract. Now, I mentioned an author with an agenda, so let's get a little bit more into that. We're going to start off by jumping a bit more into modern days, because this leads us to the movie that was made about this story. The movie. In 2012, a movie was made based on the story of the Pritchards and the Haunting. The movie is called When the Lights Went Out. Director Pat Holden was a Pontefract native related by marriage to Jean Pritchard, who was the mother of the family in 30 East Drive and part of the ghost story. Holden learned about what the historian found and he got very excited to make a movie out of it. Eventually, all the pieces fell into place for the movie and Pat began working with producer Bill Bungay. And the film was made and released in 2012. Bill Bungay is also the author of the book, The Black Monk of Pontefract. And herein lies the problem. This book has um, some facts about the haunting that have a lot of holes in them. The book tries to build itself up saying that they did all this research and they looked into all these things and they have proof behind it and they talk about how important research is, yet there's holes in their research. And this muddies the water of the story of 30 East Drive. Additionally, Bill also bought 30 East Drive and he rents it out to paranormal investigators. So he has an ongoing financial interest in beefing up the story and keeping it alive. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't paranormal incidents that occur in here. There are. I've seen different videos. I've like listened to a lot of skeptics talk about it. There are events that happen in here, but we do have to make sure that we're looking at the story and realizing that, you know, some stuff is a little suspect. So if you go in to investigate this place, just kind of go in with an open mind and try to not hang on to too much of the stories that you've heard. The problem is there was a book that was written before Bill's book, and this book was written by Colin Wilson and it's called Poltergeist. It included the first-hand accounts talking with the family and the historian Tom. Wilson points out in his book that he could not find any written account of a monk being tried and hung in Pontefract. And Wilson questions the story of this monk because he did find a lot of information about the monks, about them litigations, uh, different accusations of things they did. Like there was a big paper trail of the bad things that these monks did. So if one was executed, he should have found that information when he found all the other things about these monks. And that is our first hole in the story. But now we're going to move into the ghost stories, the, the stories of the hauntings, the, the fun stuff that you're kind of here to listen to. And as we move move into the stories, I'm going to point out a few other inconsistencies as well. The Ferrars. The Ferrars were the first family to live in 30 East Drive. They were there before the famous story of the Pritchards who moved in after them. So I'm going to tell you the brief story of the Ferrars and then show you a bit of the holes in the stories between the Ferrars and the Pritchards. The timeline of events is where the holes are. And this is where things are a little bit questionable about the Ferrar story. Let's get into it. William, aka Bill Ferrar, married Barbara May Harding on August 28th, 1950 in Pontefract. By 1954, Bill and Barbara had a two and a half year old daughter and then they made their move into 30 East Drive. Now, the thing about these houses, these were council houses that were built in the 1950s. Essentially, they're bare bones houses that were given to families and the families were required to build them up. They had no cupboards, they had like no counters, things like that. So bare bone house and the family would move in and they'd have to add everything else in it, all the amenities. Bill had to install cupboards, put up wallpaper, etc. Apparently the cupboards kept tipping, like he would install the base cupboards, he'd walk away, he'd come back and they were tipped and they weren't level anymore. And every time that he tried to put up wallpaper, it would not stick to the walls. No matter what he did, it fell back off again. So that was one of the first issues that they were facing. Then eventually the Ferrars would start experiencing tapping. They would hear tapping in the walls. They just assumed that it was the house settling or whatever other noises. But then things started to escalate. Barbara's things were being moved and she was blaming it on Bill. Bill's things were being moved around and he was blaming it on Barbara. And it was actually causing fights between the couple. 
At first, neither of them thought any of this was paranormal. They weren't really realizing that it was. But soon, they started finding scratches on their daughter's skin after she slept. So then they ended up putting gloves on her hands because they thought she was scratching herself by accident. But even after putting gloves on her hands, she was waking up with more scratches. Barbara started feeling uneasy way before Bill ever really thought anything of it. And she always insisted on leaving the curtains open at night to let some light in. One day, Bill returned home from work and Barbara announced that they were moving, that they were going to swap homes with the Pritchards. Apparently, later, Barbara's niece said that she overheard Barbara talking with her mom and that apparently she found a pillow over her baby's face and it was stuck there like something invisible was holding it down. That was the last straw that made Barbara insist on moving and they had only been living there for a year. So up next would be the Pritchard stories. But first, we face an issue. There's problems with the timeline, gaps in time that do not match up with the story from the Ferrars to the Pritchards. So, so a lot of people believe that the Pritchard story was real but many believe it was poltergeist only haunting and poltergeist is usually attached to an adolescent in the house and it goes away when they grow up or move out or whatever it may be like it's attached to a person and it's not really a ghost that's attached to a house poltergeist is a little bit of a different thing that you know we don't have proof of it anyway of exactly what these things are but that's what people think and people think that it was attached to the Pritchard children the poltergeist activity stopped so some people question if the Ferrar story is true because the time line doesn't match up. If Bill was trying to force the Ferrar story to prove that the home is haunted and it's not just attached to the kids, then he can charge ghost hunters money to investigate overnight. Pretty much saying like the house is haunted, not the children. So let's go over the timelines and then I'll let you decide on what you think is true and false. The time gaps. The home was built in the 1950s and like I said, the Ferrars moved in in 1954. And the story goes that they asked the Pritchards to swap homes with them. The story goes that they were there for only a year and they asked the Pritchards to swap homes with them, which would mean that the Pritchards moved in in 1955. But all of the stories say that the Pritchards moved into the home in 1966. The YouTube channel, The Paranormal Scholar, pointed out something very interesting here. Point of contention. Bill, who wrote the book in his book, he says that the census shows that the Ferrars were living in the house. And in the book, he says they moved in in 1954. But the censuses run only every 10 years. And in this particular town in Pontefract, the census was run in 1951 and then 1961. So if they moved in in 1954 and left in 1955, there would have been no record of them even living in this house. Additionally, the census information is only released after 100 years and this census has not been released yet to the public so there wouldn't be any way for him to really get a hold of it if they happen to even be on the census that means they moved into the house in 1951 and if they only stayed a year then that would mean that the Pritchards moved into the house in 1952 so now we're pushing the timeline back way back from 1966 everywhere it's recorded that they moved in in 1966 that's the story that's been the story and if they did move in in 1952 or 1955 that means that the first poltergeist activity that happened in 1966, it took over 10 years before anything happened. The ages of the children also don't match up with this timeline too. The ages of the children match up with the 1966 timeline. A lot of the websites as well are referencing his book too. So a lot of these timelines have been muddied. But if you look at the first book at Colin Wilson's, then the timelines in there, the 1966 is the only thing that is kind of the same across the board on all the research. And then lastly, the Ferrar's second daughter was born in 1956. And there's no part of the story that says that she was living in this house. They were moved out by then. The whole story of the Ferrars swapping houses with the Pritchard, it just doesn't make sense. The timelines do not match up here. So this is the biggest hole that I think. And if anything, I believe the Pritchard story is true. And now, you know, I sort of personally question the Ferrar story. But let me know what you think. Leave a comment below. Now, let's move on to the story of the Pritchards. The Pritchards. The Pritchard family moved in to 30 East Drive in 1966. Jean and Joe, mother and father, and their children, 15-year-old Philip and 12-year-old Diane. The first incident occurred in August of 1966, and it was surrounding Philip. 
At that time, Philip and his father, Jean, were actually fighting quite a bit. Jean was a bit of a jock and he was a coal miner and he was, you know, into sports and things like that. And Philip was more a thinker and into literature and reading and writing and things of that nature. So Jean and Philip were fighting quite a lot. And in August, there was a family vacation planned, but Philip opted to stay home and not go with them, probably because of the fighting and he probably wanted a break from it. So there was tension in the house and a lot of these poltergeist stories usually involve an adolescent child and something stressful going on. So this is the first incident. Philip was sitting outside reading his book. It was in August, it wasn't super cold out. It was warm enough. It wasn't super hot out. But his grandma was there at the house with them, probably watching over him while the family was on vacation. While she was knitting in the sitting room, she was noticing how cold it was in her room and she felt like a gust of air come through. And she figured maybe there was a window or door or something that was left open. And she was wondering why he was sitting outside for so long that he must be freezing. Philip came inside to grab a cup of tea and his grandma said to him like, oh, are you not freezing out there? How, how are you able to stay stay out there for so long. And that's when Philip looked over at his grandmother and saw there was dust falling down on her. It, w it looked like chalk dust, almost like snowing on top of her. And it was a lot and it was thick, but it wasn't coming from the ceiling. He saw that the top of the dust was just sitting above her head. So there was just, it was just floating there with no source. Then he just stood there in awe and confusion. And his grandmother looked up from her knitting and she noticed the dust that was all over her and in her tea. And she was just like, oh my gosh, okay, well, we, we better go clean this up. I don't know what's going on, right? So they started to clean it up. The grandmother went next door and the families actually live next door to one another. So grandmother went next door to grab another family member and they were cleaning it up. At this point, they were thinking, oh, it's plaster dust or something because only Philip saw the way that it was falling out of nowhere. One of them went to the kitchen to grab, you know, some stuff to clean up the dust. And then they suddenly slipped on the floor and there were these puddles on the floor and there were these perfect circular puddles and they came out of nowhere, just this water. It wasn't there a second ago. So concerned, they started ripping up the linoleum, trying to figure out if there's a leak or something. If, then they even turned off the water to the house because they were worried that there was a pipe leaking somewhere. But still the puddles kept coming up. They would clean them up and then the puddle would show back up again. Eventually they did have someone from the water company come out and they said that they couldn't find the issue and they said it must just be condensation. And then the last thing to happen that day as well was when they were in the kitchen dealing with the puddles, they heard a big bang and they were looking around like, what? what's going on so they went into the house looking around for what's happening and they saw there was a potted plant that used to be sitting down at the bottom of the stairs and they saw the plant not in its pot fallen in the middle of the stairs and the pot itself was at the top of the stairs so that was a bit of an interesting day and it was a little bit confusing but that's the only thing that happened and things went quiet again until 1968. So two years later, Diane's getting a bit older. She's becoming an adolescent now. Jean, her mother, wanted to redecorate her room to be more like a teenager's room. And this seemingly started up this intense poltergeist attack that lasted for a very long time. It carried on actually until 1969. It was a year of constant barrage and attack by an invisible force. It first started when Jean was redecorating. So Diane went to sleep and Jean pulled out the decorating stuff out of the room and just got it out of the way so that she could sleep. As Jean was sorting the stuff, suddenly things were falling and flying around and she was really confused. There was paintbrushes flying around and one like almost hit her in the face. It was a millimeter away from hitting her in the face. And then suddenly she saw the wallpaper. It stood up like a snake and then started moving towards her like a snake would. And this obviously scared the crap out of her. And this was just the beginning. They would often have things moving around. There was a lot of noise, a lot of reaction from this poltergeist. But the biggest thing is when the lights went out. Sometimes only one room would go out. Sometimes the poltergeist would turn off the entire breaker from downstairs and the whole house would go dark. And when the lights went out, when it was dark, that's when the physical attacks started happening. Diane was often pulled out of her bed, thrown against walls, pulled onto the floor and so forth. There was one incident where furniture, heavy furniture, was moving around on its own and one of them tipped onto Diane, but it wasn't pushing down on her. 
It was actually sitting just right on top of her with no weight. And that was a very strange thing because that paintbrush also just barely missed Jean's head. And other things like China was being flown out of cupboards and whatnot, and none of it ever broke. It was like it landed very softly. It's like things moved quickly, but then at the last minute was very soft and placed. So it was very strange the way that this was acting. But the most intense thing that happened one day was the whole family watched as the lights went out and it was still a little bit light out. So they saw what happened. They saw Diane's ponytail actually go up in the air and like someone was holding it and then started to drag her upstairs in invisible force. And they just saw this hair standing on end. And then they started watching like red marks showing up on Diane's neck. So this ghost, this pole Geist was pulling her up the stairs by her hair and her neck and now all throughout this thing they were trying their hardest to figure out how to clean the house like they were bringing in priests they were doing exorcisms they were doing all sorts of different stuff but then joe heard from someone like they were talking about dracula and they were like well garlic keeps away vampires and there's old folklore that says like that western europeans are still putting garlic up in their doors and windows to keep spirits out so joe was like well I'll try anything and that's what he did he hung garlic and after hanging garlic, everything stopped. It's the strangest thing. Now, despite all the like horrific stuff that was going on, the family actually gave the ghost the nickname Fred. But newspapers were doing stories on this haunting and they were giving the ghost the nickname Mr. Nobody. Now, there's a lot of other details that happened to Diane. This lasted a year, so there's multiple different details and accounts of things that happened. Pictures that were being, like, ripped up in front of them. Like, there's so many things, but I'm not going to do, like, a deep dive on everything that happened here. So I'm just kind of doing a high level of, like, some of the key events and instances of the attack at this poltergeist. And that's because I want to talk a little bit about a few other people's experiences within the house. So... Let's talk about a few other experiences that other people have had. The Ouija Brothers. The Ouija Brothers is a paranormal investigation team. And they actually went to 30 East Drive to do an investigation, but they weren't like recording. They didn't have YouTube yet. Like they were just kind of going as paranormal investigators. Uh, so there's no video evidence of this. But apparently the neighbor complained to Bill to try to get them banned from the location because the neighbor said that she heard them banging and there was just like noise and like they were just wrecking the house. So she called up Bill to get them to be banned and when bill talked to the ouija brothers they were like no the house was doing all that they were they heard growling and there was just crazy banging so loud that the neighbors were hearing it obviously and there was so much noise this is an interesting story whether it's true or not we don't know for sure there's no video or audio evidence of it like they didn't they weren't recording or anything but there's an eyewitness of the neighbor that's just one of the stories and i'll let you decide whether you think that one's true or not Dark Side Paranormal. So our next one is Dark Side Paranormal. They're friends of ours over on TikTok. And they recently went to 30 East Drive. And that's why I asked them for a little bit of an account of what they've experienced. So they explained they've been to this location two times. The first time was in 2023 and they were here recently, uh, August 27, 24. On their first visit, they were on the lounge area doing a seance and one person was on Estes and couldn't hear what was going on around him. They were standing all in darkness. This thing attacks in darkness, so it's kind of important. And then suddenly they heard a massive bang in the house from upstairs there was no physical being like no one was actually upstairs everyone was downstairs doing the seance the bane was so loud that they felt vibrations in the floors and the walls and all the items and everything even the mantelpiece shook everyone apparently started screaming of course but the person on estes they didn't hear what was going on they just sat there unaffected and then they suddenly pointed up towards the bedroom and the bedroom has a boiler in it and they think that the bang came from there. There's apparently a story that that boiler room is a possible portal. Also throughout that evening, they saw shadows of movement. There was a door in the hallway that slammed shut on them as well. And after the investigation, they checked the EVP recorder and there was silence and then static. And then the thing just stopped working. Nothing recorded at all. So there was a bunch of device malfunction. Their recent visit in 2024 was quieter. 
There was no bangs or anything like that. However, they had someone who was kind of doing meditation and sort of a medium kind of deal. Uh, they were blindfolded with headphones playing music, so they were sensory deprived. He managed to navigate from the lounge to the coal room back to the lounge without bumping into any furniture. He then proceeded to pick up the Bible and he screamed evil and threw it on the floor. He stood in the corner with his back to them, and when they asked him to turn around, he bent down and rummaged through some bits behind the sofa, and everyone was like, I don't even know how he knew that stuff was down there. And he picked out one picture and put it in front of his face, and the image he was holding was Jesus. He then proceeded to turn the cross on top of the clock of the lounge upside down. Now, this person they've done other stuff with as well. They have a couple of them that do this sort of like medium type kind of deal where they let the spirit kind of talk to them, talk through them whatever but this is the first time that they had a person walking around they were telling me throughout the night as well they also heard like taps and trigger items being set off such as motion sensor music boxes emf readers were picking up nothing and then suddenly they were going all the way to orange and red and then dropping again back down to green they had people experiencing temperature fluctuations shadows in the corner of their eyes they also had someone stand in the boiler room in the bedroom as supposedly it's the portal and he was in there and they shut the door and the next moment he came out out screaming saying someone had banged on the door so that's an account of what they experienced and i will link them below and go check them out and you can take a look at all their videos and everything they have a bunch of stuff up nukes top five now I have two accounts from Nuke's top five. This is how I first heard of 30 East Drive. And I mean, I heard of them, what, three years ago? Yeah, this, this video is old. So this is um, a little clip. I'm not gonna put the whole thing in because I want to make this video a reasonable time. This is a cleaning lady that comes in to clean the home. She was trying to tell her friends that the place was really haunted and they didn't believe her. So she went live on like Facebook or Snapchat or something like that. And this is the recording of her going live. So I'm just gonna to put a few key moments in here but i will link the nukes episode below so you can go check it out for yourself and you can watch the whole video because it's quite a long video right huh? I'm coming back to the stairs. I don't... Ah! Get out! Oh, God. Oh, man. Can anybody hear what I can hear? Can you hear it, Chris? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I don't... Let me... Right. I'm coming out. I'm coming out, wherever you are. This isn't funny no more. This is not funny. Don't, I'm right, I'm going to go on to landing. Oh. The hell? All right, I think I've had enough. I want to go down. Water's running in the bathroom. Will you open the door for me, please? I have just seen some... There's a bang from a different bedroom, and when she turns, this. It looks like some pale figure that actually reflects the light is now standing at the doorway, but it quickly ducks back inside the room. And with this, the woman has had enough. The next news clip, it's really quick. They're in an upstairs bedroom, and one of the investigators turns and looks at herself in the mirror, and her mouth just goes into a really creepy smile. So you can take a look. And chilling event, as Amy simply looks at herself in the upstairs bedroom mirror. She makes like a creepy smile. <gasps> Amy's face appears to distort into a horrifying gaping maw. They might have captured a paranormal transfiguration. It doesn't appear to be a digital glitch. You can watch the full two-part investigation at the Haunted 30 East Drive over on the YouTube channel, Shadow Hunters UK TV. What do you think so far of these uh, different accounts and things that you're seeing here? Do you think they're real? Reddit. I'm just going to read you a small account that I found on Reddit as well. It was posted by Acrobatic Ad. 
3479 regarding 30 East Drive. I went in November. My daughter's a paranormal investigator, so I tagged along on one of her investigations. The house has a very heavy energy. I felt like I had a prickly feeling all over my body, like electricity, and I got a headache as soon as I walked in. We slept the night over. I slept in the living room. It all kicked off just before dawn. I heard muffled male voices, furniture being dragged from upstairs. Nobody was up there. Footsteps going up and down the stairs, constant tapping noises. My daughter woke up to see a black figure looking over me while I was sleeping. The next morning, I just needed to get out. My daughter was violently sick and she didn't look well. We literally drove down the road from East Drive and her sickness just went away. During our investigation, we heard growls, people talking. We seen figures, lots of orbs on our CCTV as well. I don't want to go back there and I'm not easily scared and I've been to a lot of haunted places with my daughter. 30 East Drive has a dark, heavy energy and it feels like you're not welcome there. Beardo. I wanted to include a little bit of information about Beardo. He is a very famous, if you're on YouTube, you might probably, probably already know about him, but he's a very famous debunker. He's very cynical and like doesn't really take a lot of things. Like, like I tend to try to like let myself fall into the fantasy a little bit for fun, you know, but he's very serious all the time and he's always like trying to debunk stuff. He's very just cynical about things because he, he wants to see something real and he wants to see something that can be proved real and can't be debunked. Beardo is in quite a number of videos from 30 East Drive. He was invited with quite a number of people. Um, I think I found like four at least. I watched through one of them and I sort of skimmed through some others. I didn't have time to finish watching all through uh, all of them, uh, but the one that I did watch, they caught some noises, some knocks, some odd camera activity, nothing huge. I wish I had some time to watch more of his stuff so I could talk a little bit more about it, but I kind of ran out of time this week. But I wanted to bring him up because if you haven't heard of him, you should go check him out and you should add him to your subscribe list because it is important for us to try to debunk stuff and try to prove what is actually real. And he's like the best debunker out there. That being said, there is a really interesting clip that was caught live by Adelaide Haunted Horizons. And I have a clip here of him reading reacting to what they caught and what they caught looks really good and he's even a little bit flabbergasted like he wants to say it's real because he's like just he wishes that there was another camera angle so he could say 100 this is real but he's like you can tell he's kind of leaning on the side of this is real so this is a really cool clip i wanted to include it but i wanted to include it with his reactions so that you got a little bit of an experience with the debunking part of it as well just natural building sound, I think. There's a bit of a tap up there. I like it. A little bit of debunking as they go in. Uh, that's me creaking as well, by the way, if you're wondering what that, I like it. that noise is. If you're going to make a sound, it's got to be a loud one. A weird groan sound. They haven't highlighted that either, so I assume that is something to do with the whatever the camera is sat on. I've said it before that even mine with all the sponge and everything on it to stop movement does make noise. There's a doll at the top of the stairs there. She should be in the bedroom. Oh my God. Oh my God. She should be in the bedroom. Oh my god. Oh my god. Um guy People are limited by the equipment they got. I would love absolutely loved for it to have been a third camera at the top of the stairs looking down because that would prove without a shadow of a doubt that what we've just seen there is real and this is not me saying that this video is fake unfortunately somebody could be laying on the landing with a stick and give it a little thwack and then over it goes however that looks like it lifts from the bottom up like somebody has literally grabbed the legs of that doll and flipped it that's not been pushed. That looks like it's been flipped. Now, you could do that with a wire. You could be stood up on the landing and give it a yank. But I know very little about this channel. I've seen a few small clips of them, and I've never seen anything that would 
alert me to say these guys are faking because they don't get a lot. That's got me. That's got me a bit puzzled. To be fair, I hope this is real. And she was well balanced against that wall, as you saw. I mean, she's not even like teetering on the edge of the step there. She's quite a bit back. And also, if somebody was laying on the landing with a stick, the thwack it, you'd see it across this because they'd have to aim the stick down. That's not to say that it can't be faked. Somebody could have put their hand at the back there in line with a skirting board or something in the hand and given it up. But to me, it looks like these legs get picked up. I literally, at this point, don't know which way to swing. But I don't think it's fake. Do I think it's paranormal? I don't know. It should be a new year. I've, I've still been watching this video trying to debunk it. This was live. She live streamed this. Which adds a little bit more credibility to it. That's just a few ghost stories. There's a lot of stories and accounts and different paranormal investigation teams that have stories to tell about 30 East Drive. And, you know, I do think it's haunted. I just, my, personally, I question the story of the Ferrars. The timeline does not make sense. The story does not make sense. It just kind of feels like it was a story made up so that people would believe that the place was haunted and not the kids. And I don't know, considering that the owner of the house has a financial gain in the house and also he's selling the books and also you have to pay to watch the movie too. Like he's got a big financial investment here. So I don't really trust his book, to be honest. There is a lot of inconsistencies in it. So I'd rather read like someone else's accounts instead. But you tell me what you think. Do you think the place is haunted? Do you think that it was just a poltergeist only attached to the Pritchards at the time? What do you think about some of the other stories that I shared with you from different investigators? Leave a comment below and let me know. Now, if you found this interesting and you enjoy hearing some more about ghost stories, check out my episode from last week from the Stanley Hotel, where I go through every ghost story that's in every part of the hotel. So if you want to hear about some more fun ghost stories, check it out. I will link it up here. If you've enjoyed today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I appreciate you watching my video today. I hope you have a great rest of your night.